Hello everybody, and welcome back to Space Engine. Oh, I'm still in rocket mode, aren't I? Indeed I am. It has been, what, two months? My goodness. I am still making these. I try to do at least once a month, because this is kind of like just the unscripted, I can just talk about whatever videos. And, um, they're comfy in their own way, I suppose. But no, I have just been very, very busy and haven't really been able to sit down and just make one of these. Well, so I decided to do it now, when I had some time. <laughs> My goodness, uh, what's going on in the world? A lot. Um, no recommendations to go places, so we're just going to have to make it up as I go along. But, yeah. I've been working on a couple, actually, like three projects, really. Uh, the pond in my backyard... Which is pretty much done, uh, and now that it's fall, I can just leave it alone, and I can put gravel in it in the spring, and uh, it, no more work on it, so it's great. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I've been working on the radio telescope some more, as that's been complicated, and I've been working on uh, water and wind turbines, which is actually quite interesting and going quite well. I actually recently got a 100 watt generator uh, in the mail. That's going to be hooked up to my first, like, small-scale wind turbine prototype. It's going to power a battery, or it's going to charge, like, a, probably a lead-acid battery uh, in my greenhouse, and it's going to power some LED lights or a fan or something. What it powers isn't important. It's mostly just a test bed. Because what I want to do is I want to build a much bigger version. Because it's a, um, like, a Savonius-type wind turbine, but it's, like, a helical design, so it kind of... It's like a, a helical cup, or a dual cup system. Basically a helix. And, um, it's omnidirectional, so the wind will spin it regardless what direction the wind comes from. And, uh, all these are blue giants. Oh, there we go. And I want it to... Well, what I, what I, what I want to do is I want, I want to make a big version that I can set up, like, in the divide, in uh, like, like in highways. Like, the divide between highways going left and right. Or, yeah, whatever. And um, basically have it just absorb power from passing cars, which isn't my idea. It's actually an idea that's been thrown around a number of times. There's a company in the UK, I think, that, that that's working on this. And uh, I think one in the US. It's... point is, it's, it, it, it's a workable idea. The idea is you have, like, wind turbines that just basically use the, like, the airflow from passing cars and trucks to spin and collect power because like the turbine will work in like just from normal wind but uh you'll get more consistent wind on roadways because people will always drive cars we have a subterranean or subglacial uh mini aquaria i'm tired <laughs> brain is not working right now and yada, yada organic life lovely but the other star oop but yeah, so I've, I've been kind of working on that. I want to get the, um... Well, like, what I want to do is have, like, two or three 500 to 1,000 watt generators. Why isn't this working? Oh, wrong star. Uh, like, generators. And I want them to be, like, charging up a, um, a thermal battery. And the idea of, like, like what I'm going to do with the thermal batteries, I'm thinking of using, um... I keep wanting to say glycol, but it is not glycol. It's, um, glycerol. There we go. <laughs> it's, basically a, a, it's basically a sugar. But yeah, glycerol. And have it as, as a phase change material for the battery. So you can heat it up, and it turns into a liquid. And it can store fairly high temperatures, because it doesn't boil until, like, what, 200 and something degrees? Or 300 degrees Celsius? I'm thinking of trying to see if I can keep it at a stable either 50 to 100 degrees Celsius. That way you get a lot of thermal energy storage, but without serious problems. I think I calculated it where it's like a 20 liter battery running at 50 degrees. It can store about one kilowatt hour of energy. It might have been 100. I don't know. My notes are somewhere. My notes are down in my workshop. They're not right here with me at the moment. But point is, it's like, yeah, battery turbines. Turbines heat battery. Battery stores power. And then you use thermoelectric generators on the uh, the battery to extract energy and power 
whatever you want, uh, street lights or something. And the water turbine version, oh wait a minute, is the life actually in the planet? Oh it is, it's exotic unicellular, cool. And the water version, I want to have that, it's basically the same turbine, but it's on its side, and it has a, a cowling that covers the bottom half with a ramp going up into it. And uh, it, it's, I, I designed it to, f to like operate in low flow, low conditioned waters, because I wanted to be able to work in a river that's frozen over, because I live in Canada, and the river freezes over in the winter. So I'm thinking like 24 hour, uh, year round constant energy from a low flow turbine, just either in a pre-made channel or uh, in just the riverbed, not interfering with fish and wildlife because it's it's not harmful to them and just generates power. And with that one, I wanted to also, you know, store energy in a thermal battery, but then use that energy just to like produce hydrogen, like, like just dedicated hydrogen. And uh, that would be a pilot project where it would just produce small amounts as a proof of concept. It wouldn't be like industrial or anything. But yeah, so I've, I've been working on that a lot. Um, been talking to a lot of people. There's actually a uh, like a grant system in my uh, province. And I'm going to be, once I get the, like the, 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 the small turbine on my greenhouse done, I'm going to start submitting proposals to them. To see if I can get uh, some financial help for it, you know, if somebody finds it interesting, why not? It never hurts to ask. I mean, simply asking questions got me uh, the ability to install my radio telescope at an actual observatory, so it's like, it never hurts to ask. Organic unicellular marine, cold, lacustrian aquatic uh, aquaria with life. The atmosphere is very thick, it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen. The seas are made of sulfur dioxide. Oh, cool. It's kind of like in that the video I made where it's like, where could life possibly exist? And I made the comment of uh, exotic life living in sulfur dioxide uh, under the crust of Io. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Interesting. Why, uh, would there be a nitrogen atmosphere? Yeah, nitrogen's pretty inert. I don't know if it reacts with uh, sulfur dioxide. Yeah, what was I talking about? All oh, right, the turbines. But yeah, so that's... They've been the primary, um, like, work has been turbine stuff. So much turbine stuff. I need to actually go and hook up everything. And I need to make a bracket to hold it, because I, I, the, the generator itself doesn't really have a mounting bracket, and it's vertical. Although, okay, I'm pretty sure the, the generator is made for a horizontal wind turbine. But they said it'll work with a, with a vertical one as well, and it it probably will. Um, when I spin it by hand, it does feel like it requires more, ooh, more life. Uh, it requires more um, force to get it spinning than I was hoping, but it's still like it's it's not a lot. Like it, it still is. Um, it's small enough that, that the turbine should be able to spin it without too much issue in reasonable wind speeds. It'll work perfectly fine for the water turbine, so worst case scenario, I just make it work with that, and I get a, a maglev generator for the wind turbine, which I probably should have in the first place, but this one was cheaper, and uh, I'm not cheap, but I'm frugal. and yeah, no, I'm cheap. What an interesting little planet. It is quite lovely. I want to say green but it's like that shade of green that might be yellow, and I get yellow and green mixed up, because they, they look the same to me. Like the light green and the yellow. There's like no differentiation for me, so... This could be yellow, it could be green, I have no idea. It's in that wavelength at which I cannot differentiate, but it looks quite nice. Um, different, I should say, not maybe not nice. <laughs> Uh, actually, I had somebody ask me about talking about naked singularities in Space Engine, and I was not under the impression, or I was not aware, that you could find naked singularities in Space Engine. And um, that makes sense to me, because as far as we currently know in physics, you can't find naked singularities at all. Um, let's go see if we can find black holes, I guess. No. Okay, there is a way to sort by object, and I always forget, nope, that's, that's what's wrong, I always forget how to do it, 
Okay, let's go to Cygnus X1. Star. But it has a black hole. Yeah, whatever. It's just, it's just, it's the one black hole I know the most about. Yay. Alright. So now a naked singularity is a black hole that does not have an event horizon. I can't help but feel that these graphics look terrible. And I don't know if that's because of my computer or because of the shaders. Huh. The shaders did take a long time to load. Something might have broken, I'll have to check. Or maybe it's just that's what they're supposed to look like. But yeah, okay, black hole, um, rapidly spinning. This is very clearly not a naked singularity. It has a event horizon and accretion disk. Ain't that lovely. Oh yeah, you can see it's like black hole looks like a disk. Then you look, look at it from the side, and the disk bends around it. Lovely. Actually, I'm going to check out Sagittarius A star. So... It's not a star, that's for sure. Yeah, because, and one of the reasons why you can't have a naked singularity, like, like, like this, for example, the black circle in the middle, that's the event horizon. You can't, you can't see the actual singularity. And one of the reasons for that is literally censorship, but not government censorship. It's, uh, it's like the cosmic censorship, censorship principle, where it's like, um, singularities need to have an event horizon around them so they cannot be observed because if they can be observed basically physics breaks and the universe ends because um that's just how it works <laughs> it's basically because at a singularity or near a singularity um pr uh, there's no predictability about the evolution of space-time so like you can't the mathematics of the universe do not work in in these conditions uh, around the, the singularity ba it's, it's kind of like having computer code and then you decide to just completely remove a bunch of the code and then the whole thing stops working that's basically it because um, near a naked singularity your black or your well, black hole no um, the universe just doesn't doesn't work uh, there, there's no there's no way to basically rectify it with physics. So if we could observe a naked singularity, it would probably mean the singularity. It would mean the singularity would have, to, would have to be exposed, and that would put it in a situation in which it's it's within. I should say not touching. It's really hard to explain this. I'm not a I'm not an astrophysicist, <laughs> but basically it would be. It would come into conflict with the universe because the rest of the universe operates on predictability and a lot of these laws are needed for the universe to function and if you can observe something in which these laws suddenly stop working you are now in conflict with the rest of the universe and physics will just stop uh it will 404 and tell you have a good day and then it'll dip so, yeah, I, I I don't even know what a naked singularity would I think a naked singularity would basically look like a distorted like a, like a distorted ball, but without the black event horizon in the middle. That's kind of what I'm guessing. Um, yes, yeah, so it, would, it would look kind of like this, but without the center darkness. You'd be able to see all the way through it, and it would just cause problems. Oh, there actually is an accretion disk here. Yeah, there was an update that I missed in a uh, space engine because this is um it's very pretty, very bright. But the black holes now have accretion disks that are actually similar to what we see uh from the Event Horizon telescope. Interesting. They look more grainy. That might just be my computer, though. My, my computer sucks. It is um, nine years old, and it's been getting worse and worse. I need to get a new one 
Uh, I can't afford it, but I will at some point. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I don't know about Naked Singularities and Space Engine. I have never been able to find one. I don't think they can exist. Um, I mean, you can make them exist in the game, because it's a video game. But you would, they, would, they would have to be an independent object where it's just like, yeah, it, it looks distorty and weird. <laughs> it wouldn't work within the framework of, uh, like, actual physics. A diffuse nebula. Lovely. Actually, yeah, my telescope. I'm thinking of keeping it as a single aperture telescope. Because originally the idea was to do a, uh, an array of three. Where I'd have three of them in a triangle. And I'd interferometer them. And why am I going so fast? But I've kind of been thinking that I'm going to keep it as a single aperture telescope. Which means right now it'll be smaller. It's only two meters wide. So it's not terribly powerful. It's been on, in, in operation uh, this week, actually. I, 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 I turned the, the stream on on Twitch as much as I can. It's usually on for a day. I turn it off at night when I'm doing work on it. So I'll have a link down below if you want to check out the uh, the Twitch channel where it just streams data from it. But um, what I'm thinking of doing is... How come Cygnus X1 is still here? What I'm thinking of doing oh, is over time, instead of making it a larger array, just make it a larger dish. And this is for a couple of reasons. If you're doing actual, like, if you're doing observing of specific objects, and you're doing imaging especially, an array is very good, because you get much better resolution, um, you can cover more sky, and you can basically make better resolution observations of particular objects, and you have more versatility in those objects with an array. But what I'm doing is SETI research, like that's the point of the telescope, it just points up and looks for signals. And in that category, it's probably better to do single aperture, because with an, with, with an array, you get noise from each telescope, like each thing. It's impossible to get rid of all the noise. And the more telescopes you have, the more noise seeps in. And you also have um, issues with they're called side lobes. It's basically like radiation spillover around the edges of the dishes. And a number of just issues like that, basically. And a single aperture is better in this situation because since it's just one receiver and a large dish, you get less uh, you get less noise because you only have to, to you know account for one receiver producing noise. And you can deal with the side lobes easier. And it's also easier to update. Um, like one of the things is like my telescope, uh, the actual feed horn on the front, it's it's just basically a, a tube. It's just a cylinder. And because of that, it actually does have some noise issues with the side of the telescope. So I actually have to move it down a little bit so that it's not receiving uh, reflections from like a centimeter around the edge of the of the uh, the dish. And it, it, it's fine, but it means that I'm missing out on some surface area. Whereas if I make the dish bigger, I can put a flange around the end of it, which is called a choke. And what that does is it basically eliminates those, um, like the issues with like the side of the telescope. It basically isolates it, so you can use the full dish. And the reason why I don't have one on my disc, uh, on my uh, dish right now, is because. It basically would make a, it would ca it casts a shadow like a radio a radio uh, yeah a shadow on the dish that radio waves can't get through, and with the two meter dish the size of the the shadow is it would it would amount to about the same as just moving the, the horn down and cutting off the outer edge of the dish, so it's not there's no it's not worth it, but if I were to make a five meter dish then I could toss a choke onto it and it would be advantageous because it would you know do the same thing but would actually it would result in less losses than what I currently have so plan is I'm going to be doing just a larger dish uh, the two meter dish will probably be ugh, it was supposed to be set up this year it'll probably be next spring honestly out at the observatory and it'll just run 24 7 continuously until I can get uh, a new dish set up which will probably be the five meter dish and that'll replace it whenever I can afford that. It's quite expensive. I'm probably looking at like, what? Maybe six, seven thousand dollars <laughs> for the new dish. So it's, it's not gonna be right right away or anytime soon. It'll probably be a few years down the line. 
And until then, the current dish will be doing uh, all my heavy work for me. But the idea is to use the dish and the telescope to kind of build interest in the project and try to get more funding. Because I sure do love me my funding. And from there, uh, you know, five meter dish, get a better telescope, get, 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 you know, get more reception, better quality stuff. And what I would love to do eventually, and this is mostly speculation at this point and just, you know, wishful thinking, but I would love to buy some really crappy land uh, outside of the city here, which it does exist. You can get some pretty crappy stuff, especially like in the prairies that nobody wants to be. And just basically build a hundred meter dish on it, like a big old dish, either dig it out and concrete it up and make like a, a tornado proof dish and lug in the ground, or just build one um, using a big frame above ground, just big old dish, hundred meters pointing straight up and then hope tornadoes don't destroy it, which they probably will because it's the prairies and that's what they do. But <laughs> the idea would be to have like a mini uh, Arecibo with the collection range of Green Bank Observatory that I would own and can use myself and tell other people no. Because that's my problem with SETI telescopes. If people are like, we're building a new telescope and we're going to do SETI searches with it, and then the other astrophysicists come rolling up and are like, can we use your telescope? And they're like, yeah, you can. And then while they're observing, a, you know, galactic nuclei and pulsars and stuff, it's like they're not looking for aliens. And it's like that defeats the point of the dish. It's like buying a new car and then everybody else wants to borrow it. So I'm going to build, I want to build a very big observatory, a big telescope that has really good reception. And I'll be like, no, nah, man, it's a SETI telescope. Can't use it unless it's a SETI project. And I'll be like, can you steer it? I'll be like, no, <laughs> it's a Zenith telescope. I mean, if I made it like a spherical dish, like the uh, like Fast in China, or even like Arecibo, you can do some steering by um, changing like the direct, like where the receiver is above it. But if you did that, you would end up having to re use a smaller area on the dish for receiving, because like, like, the shadow would have to be different. Whereas if I just made it one big dish where the entire dish is being used and the receiver is not motile, then I get a far better like collection area, but I can't steer it. So I, you know, the earth has to steer it. So basically it's like if people can, you know, if, if, if an astronomer were to show up and be like, hey, in X number of weeks, this target is me passing over your telescope um, for like 60 minutes. Can we observe it? In that case, I'd be like, sure, because you're just observing it as, as an object as it passes over. That would be fine. You're not going to monopolize my telescope. So basically, I'm going to build a big telescope so that I can use it. Everybody would be free to use um, the data. Like, it would all be freely available. But its project would be singular. And I would, I would be king of my radio telescope. I would share the data, though, because I believe in free data. All right, that's been 23 minutes. I'll let you go now. I have to go back to work. <laughs> I'm tired. But yeah, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you have suggestions on places for me to go or things to see or talk about, let me know in the comments below. And space. <laughs>